Good evening. Welcome to Around the World with Dee and Friends. Tonight I have my very good friend, Dr. Joseph Firestone, with me. And we have some topics tonight. We're going to discuss why the U.S. is provoking the closing Gulf. And we've been watching that and noticing that this has been going on for a while now. And then why is he saying Karen went to Niger? And Dr. Joseph Firestone is going to start us off with that. Okay, D. Yes. Uh, something started to go wrong with your sound again. Okay. It was sounding as if you were in the cave once more. Okay. Let me see. How is this? Is this any better? Yes, it sounds better. Okay, great. Okay, so this is from Signs of the Times. Okay, this piece. And it's, it, it's in a category called uh, Puppet Masters. The headline is Bad Sign. Victoria Newland. Washington's regime change, Karen, quote unquote, <laughs> wants to speak to the manager in Niger. And this uh, this article was written by Rachel Marsden. I guess she identifies herself as from um, 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 RT. So she's an RT correspondent, I guess. Yeah, she's independent as well. Okay. And there's a picture of Victoria Newland. Very <laughs> re regime change, Karen. Yep, that's her. That's her. Famous for her puppeteering. During the 2014 Ukraine coup, I'm going to make this a little more visible. The type is too small. There we go. I've, I have really jacked it up now, so you should be able to see it. Yes, I can see it better. Famous for a puppeteering during the 2014 Ukraine coup, the thinking... Behind this choice okay, of envoy couldn't be clearer. Yes, the thinking behind this choice of envoy is we need someone to go and deliver a threat. Going on with the article, <laughs> I started editorializing on the first line. France has been kicked out of Niger by its new military government. By extension, placing U.S. interests there um, in peril, as well as French interests, of course. Who would ever have thought that the U.S. footing the bill for training Nigerian soldiers would result in a net gain for Russia and China? Apparently not the United States State Department. Enter Victoria, Victoria Newland with demands to speak to those in charge. She's officially the acting U.S. Deputy, uh, Deputy Secretary of State. Yeah, she hasn't been confirmed by the Congress yet, so she's acting. I personally think she does a lot of acting. Uh, Newland should really change her title to, quote, regime change Karen, unquote. In modern parlance, a Karen, quote, unquote, is a middle-aged woman who uses her privilege to get her way or police other people's behaviors, unquote. Karen can often be spotted at the customer service desks of big box stores demanding to speak to the manager or in this case, the military leaders now in charge of Niger. Newland rocked up to Niger 
I think that means she flew over, to, <laughs> took a flight, okay, to New Share immediately, demanded to speak to the Astrid president, but was refused the opportunity. Instead, she got to meet with one of the coup leaders, the new Army Chief of Staff, specifically Brigadier General Musa Salau Barmu, who not only trained at Fort Benning in Georgia, that is, and at Washington's National Defense University, but was photographed alongside U.S. Special Operations in Africa Commander Lieutenant General Jonathan Braga just a few weeks ago at a U.S. drone base in Niger. Here's a tweet from Soka Africa, status Special Operations in Africa. Uh, U.S. SOC Commander Lieutenant General Jonathan Braga recently visited at uh, Army Niger Commander Brigadier General uh, Musa Barmu at Air Base 101 Niger as part of a regional effort to promote security and strengthen partnerships. And you can see the two of them shaking hands there. In a State Department teleconference on Monday, Newland said she was in Niger, quote, because we wanted to speak frankly to the people responsible to this challenge to the democratic order. That must be a misquote because it's to the people responsible for this challenge to the democratic order. That didn't actually require a foreign trip, though. She could have stayed home and just called the staff meeting. You made this mess yourselves, guys. Quote, the benefit from the joint motor training event is twofold. Uh, providing Nigerian soldiers with a tangible skill while also bolstering the partnership between U.S. and Niger forces, quote. Sorry, that's the end of the quote. Uh, the Pentagon said in 2021 of a joint training exercise, looks like all those skills came in handy when it came to kicking out a U.S. allied France. Quote, we met with the self-proclaimed chief of defense of this operation, General Barmu, and three of the colonels supporting him, Newland said. Quote, I will say that these conversations were extremely frank and at times difficult. At times quite difficult because, again, we were pushing for a negotiated solution, unquote. Interesting how peace and also negotiations suddenly appear on the table when Washington loses its foothold, finds itself in too weak or precarious a position to start dropping bombs, and needs to buy some time to regain the upper hand. Such was the case with the Russia-Ukraine-Minsk agreements of 2014-2015, which used peace as a pretext for better arming Kiev against Moscow, as Western allies trained and supplied Ukrainian neo-Nazis at Russia's doorstep. Newland not so, sin so subtly hinted at Washington's priorities when she said that she, quote, had a chance to sit with a broad cross-section of Nigerian civil society, unquote, describing them as, quote, longtime friends of the United States. In other words, to better shore up the in-country proxies to defend uh, U.S. interests. Washington and regime change, Karen here, are unabashed control freaks. Newland was long obsessed with Europe's Nord Stream pipeline of cheap Russian gas till it was mysteriously blown up. 
She was spotted in Ukraine back in 2014 handing out cookies to anti-government protesters and caught discussing the potential roles of Ukrainian opposition leaders post-regime change. That recording leaked, featuring Newland expressing just how much he values U.S. allies in international law when they don't align with Washington's agenda, uh, Washington's agenda for Kiev once U.S.-friendly puppets are installed. Quote, so this would be great, I think, to help glue this thing and have the U.N. help glue it. And you know, uh, fuck the EU, unquote. (laughs) Newland told U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, Jeffrey Pyatt, At a Senate hearing earlier this year into, quote, Russian aggression in Ukraine and beyond, Nguyen demonstrated that she couldn't even resist keeping her hands off neighboring, um, 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 uh, 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 Belarus, underscoring that the U.S. was, quote, working intensively with the Belarusian um, opposition, unquote. Regime change, Karen has her nose in everyone's business, seems to run in the family as her husband, Robert Kagan, is a prominent neoconservative interventionist whose biography on the State Department website describes him as an expert on, quote, NATO expansion, unquote. He also co-founded the project for the New American Century, PNAC, Think Tank which set out the blueprint for endless U.S. regime change wars against countries that didn't adhere to what didn't adhere to Washington's agenda. In Niger, that agenda includes keeping the door unlocked so that Washington can come and go as it pleases, like it has in Ukraine, up to and including the point of being able to exploit the country's resources or use it as a crash pad for operations against its uh, geopolitical foes, which would explain why the CIA set up a drone base in Niger for its African operations in the wake of the Benghazi fiasco in Libya, after which Washington lost its foothold there. It's likely not a coincidence that Libya is right next door to Niger. Hmm. You can see on the map here, uh, the red marks the place, okay, in Niger. And to the left and above is Algeria, which threw out the French, by the way, a long time ago in 1962. And then there's Libya to the right, okay, and above as well. So you can see the critical position in Niger is pretty close to both of those. This region, by the way, just below that Niger is a part of, it's just below the Sahara, it's called the Sahel. Mauritania and Mali are in it, Chad, Sudan, okay, and Eritrea. Just above Sudan, of course, okay, is Egypt. So, the caption on the photo says Niger is conveniently close to other African nations the U.S. would like to dominate. Washington apparently did not foresee that Nigerian troops would take their U.S.-funded training and use it to start defending themselves against what they perceived to be Western interference. Regime change Karen seems miffed that they didn't follow the usual path of getting trained up by the U.S. to subsequently be used and exploited to fight Washington's wars. If Newland and her colleagues 
have any potential at all for introspection, uh, for introspection amid this fallout in uh, Niger, they might want to start considering what would happen if the Western-backed, um, as of uh, neo-Nazis, also decide someday to betray the interests of their benefactors in favor of defending their own with all their generously donated fire powder, courtesy of Western taxpayers. Well, of course, Western taxpayers aren't involved in, in spending, actually. In which case, good luck trying to get your money back or finding the manager. He probably wouldn't be sporting a name tag, maybe just a Nazi tattoo. Ooh. Well, that was pretty much a good hatchet job on Victoria Newland. Yeah, considering who her husband is, you can see why Newland. Well, it's not just her husband. I mean, she's just as bad as her husband in every way. She's just as bad as he is, and maybe that's their connection. Yeah, they're two peas in a pod. Yes. Uh, however... Uh, let us point out that this article as well doesn't give us a full picture of what is going on there. There's a security framework okay, in the Sahel and West Africa generally. It goes by the name okay, of ECOWAS. Uh, I think the E stands for economic and the S in it stands for security. It's a, okay, a security alliance okay, um, as well. Okay, and Niger belongs to that. And so do a number of other nations, for example, Senegal and Nigeria also, which is just below Niger. Not well shown on this map but it's just below Niger. And what is Nigeria? Okay. It is the most populous nation in all of Africa. Uh, it's hard to pin down the population because there are so many quotations of it. But there appears to be, in 2023, 224 million people living there, which is more than Brazil. So it's the sixth largest nation in the world by population. It also has a big army. Its army is bigger than Poland's. If you were watching my stream last night, uh, then I mentioned that it has military forces considerably larger okay, than Poland's. So it's probably the leading military force okay, in Africa okay, at this point. So there was talk of Nigeria um, um, intervening um, in the conflict and intervening on the side of the president who was deposed. In other words, on the side of U.S. interests, supposedly a lot of the Nigerian military is for that and maybe is itching to get in there. But the Nigerian Senate seems to disagree because they voted for negotiation and not for a military uh, intervention. And there's a comment on this article, which I'm just about to read. Comment, hoping for introspection from the fanatical neocons who see themselves as the rightful rulers of the world is pretty much a fool's errand. 
This situation will have to be seen to its probably disastrous end. The potential presence of Russia's Wagner Group may prove an interesting wild card. One of the leaders of last week's coup in Niger has reportedly sought the assistance of Russian defense contractor Wagner Group PMC as the junta nears a deadline to either return the ousted president to power or face a possible military intervention by neighboring states. General Salafu Moody allegedly made the request during a visit to Mali, where he met with a Wagner uh, representative. You'll notice on the map okay, that Mali is very close to Niger. It's right on uh, your left as you look at the map. Mm-hmm. And Burkina Faso, which is another country that recently had a military coup, it had a military coup. Mali also had a military coup. And the co-leaders, the coup leaders in Mali and Burkina Faso are supporting the Niger coup leaders. Now, I just want to say that um, okay, the leader, the former president of um, Niger was sent to Nigeria. Uh, the former president of Niger? Yes, he was sent to Nigeria, and they, um, I don't remember the person's name, but to, um, I guess over the weekend, they went and um, have a, somebody as their leader. They elected, um, I don't remember his name. Okay, I think he was the current uh, finance minister. Oh. Okay, and the coup leaders, I think, have elected him as, I don't remember whether it was the new president or the new prime minister. Yeah, I'm thinking prime minister, but I didn't want to say that because I wasn't sure, but I'm thinking you're right, prime minister. Yes, I think so. Anyway, going on with the comment, neither Wagner nor Russian government officials have commented on the Hunter's alleged request for help from the contractor. The Kremlin said on Friday that any interference in Niger from powers outside the region would be unlikely to improve the situation. Quote, we continue to favor a swift return to constitutional normality without endangering human lives. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov of Ukraine fame said to reporters, Wagner chief Yevgeny Prigozhin has called the coup a, quote, justified rebellion of the people against Western exploitation, unquote. Wagner has become a major player in the African security landscape, though it's unclear how its influence on the continent stands after its mutiny uh, uh, in Russia against Moscow in June. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has said that the future of contracts Wagner signed with various African countries is a matter for those client governments to decide. The firm's troops have reportedly operated in such countries as Mali, Burkina Faso, Sudan, Central African Republic and Mozambique. Mm -hmm. So they've operated in a number of countries, which makes them sound, of course, like they have a very large presence in Africa. Uh, But they actually don't. I think in the whole of Africa, they have something like two to three thousand troops. Okay, it's a small number. Now, they can be decisive, though, in certain nations that are being subject to coups, either in putting down the coups or supporting the coups. And, of course, they're trained soldiers. Uh, They're veterans of a number of fights. Uh, Some of them are Africans. In other words, they recruited uh, by the Wagner Company. 
and trained by the company. Uh, so it's not simply Russians who are down there fighting under the Wagner label. They're Africans who are fighting there as well. Here's a further comment. Vicky sticks her oar in And it mentions Victoria Newland's trip there. It recalls for us that she was instrumental in the Western Baku in Ukraine in 2014. She also said she urged the coup leaders to hear our offers to try to work with them to solve this diplomatically and return to constitutional order. So this is all supposed to be about returning to the constitutional order but we really know it's about the uranium in uh, Niger. And Niger also has gold. It's one of the major gold producing countries. So this is probably about these key resources and keeping them available to Western countries. Uh, most notably France, which needs the uranium uh, very much, desperately. Uh, so, well, so Newland said, based on her meetings with uh the nigerians and quote i got the sense in my meetings today the people who have taken this action here understand very well the risks to their sovereignty when wagner is invited in okay unquote i have to add something to this also everybody's really got to understand this aspect of things which I didn't understand until Ben Norton made it uh, clear for me in a video that he did uh, today. Uh, okay. The monetary unit in a number of these Sahel countries is the Central African franc. Now, the Central African franc Uh, used to be tied to the franc. In other words, it was a monetary unit of account that was pegged to the value of the franc. But when the French went into the EU, its value since then has been pegged uh, to the euro. And its value, in fact, then, okay, is uh, uh, dependent on uh, the number of euros the European Central Bank okay, decides uh, to issue. So the key point here is that Niger is not a monetary sovereign. Its currency is dependent on uh, the euro. The variations in the value of this currency is dependent on the variations in value okay, of the European currency. So Niger is not okay, an economic sovereign. Okay, it is not a monetary sovereign. It's dependent very much on what happens to the euro. And that depends on the amount of money that the European Central Bank chooses uh, to issue. So that's an important aspect of the crisis down there. And gives an incentive also to the countries that are breaking loose from the control of France and control of the EU that want, okay, their economic independence 
gives them a great big incentive to try to join BRICS as quickly as they can and hope that BRICS starts its new currency soon. So these nations will no longer be dependent on uh, the euro. Hmm. Oh, like what a web is weaved, huh? Yeah, it's a complicated web being woven there, okay, in Africa. And it isn't clear just how much influence the U.S. has anymore. Its influence is fading because people really resent okay, its influence. And uh, the taking action in these various countries uh, to get rid of the economic influence of the West and also the military influence okay, of the West. Mm -hmm. So it remains to be seen how this is going to work out. It's certain that when Newland was over there, that uh, she delivered a threat, okay, of intervention. Standing in the way of this threat is that both the United States and France are very short, okay, on ammunition. Uh, due to the effects of the Ukraine war and what they've had to give, okay, to Ukraine. Of course, it wouldn't take much to intervene there, but it's likely the U.S. will prefer to have uh, its proxies intervene there so that they will try to persuade the ECOWAS group and particularly Nigeria to intervene there. Now, if Nigeria intervenes there, it has overwhelming military capability compared to, uh, to Niger. And even compared to the combination of Niger, uh, um, 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 Mali, and Burkina Faso. Uh, so a lot is going to depend on what uh, Nigeria, the superpower, as it were, in that area decides to do. As we mentioned before, and as Dee informed me before uh, this broadcast uh, started, uh, the Nigerian Senate has voted for negotiations. I don't know whether that's going to be controlling in that country okay, or not, but it should certainly put some constraint on whether the ECOWAS group, which is the group Nigeria is a part of, decides to intervene themselves okay, on behalf of Mohamed Bazoum who was the deposed president, okay, of Niger, and who is uh, a Western puppet. Yes, he sure is. Okay, as he was called, okay, in an article that I covered on my show yesterday, uh, he's often called the French Poodle. <laughs> now, which is... Okay. Certainly kind of funny. So this is a crisis that has occurred. It's a crisis that we've created, okay, in West Africa. The evidence is that three quarters of the population support of the coup generals, that this is a popular coup. Mm -hmm. And so the West should not be intervening here and should not be trying to persuade the other West Africans to repress the coup okay, in this country. We don't know how this is going to go, but if what the Nigerian Senate wants to do stands, 
it could be a significant foreign policy defeat for the United States in West Africa. Yes, and a lot of the countries just, they want to try to negotiate. They don't want any kind of war in the country. You know, they've had enough. You're right, and they don't want Western soldiers in the country. No. And they don't want to be fighting a proxy war where the proxy is Nigeria. Uh, they don't want that. You know, and they're all Africans, you know, and Africa has to unite. They're all Africans, and brothers shouldn't be fighting brother, you know? Yeah, yes. And hopefully, even uh, the Nigerians won't want to intervene, that they will listen to their Senate, and that they will stay home this time. So we're just going to have to see. Yes. Okay, I'm going to go pull up the Persian Gulf. Yes, let's do that. The U.S. provoking this Persian Gulf. Newland's uh, seems to be a trademark. Okay, this piece is by Press TV. Yes, Press TV. And it was written on Tuesday the 8th. Explainer, why U.S. military buildup in Persian Gulf signifies open provocation. And that seems to be the trademark of uh, the U.S. Well, there might be something else behind this also, but anyway, let's go on. Yes, by Hassan Ahmadi. On August 3rd, the U.S. military announced a plan to deploy armed troops on commercial ships in the Strait of Hormuz, continuing the unilateral measures to stoke instability in the Persian Gulf. The latest provocation was reported by Western media outlets, citing four anonymous U.S. officials who said the final decision was yet to be made and that the deployment will be carried out at the request of civilian ships. The announcement came just when the landing ship USS Carter Hall and the amphibious assault ship USS Bataan were on their way to the Persian Gulf carrying thousands of U.S. Marines and sailors. In a statement on Monday, U.S. Naval Forces Central Command said more than 3,000 Marines and sailors arrived in the Western Asian region proving earlier media reports right. Last month, U.S. Defense Security Lloyd, Secretary Lloyd Austin ordered the escalation, in quotes, in response to recent attempts by Iran to seize commercial ships in West Asia, according to a statement from U.S. Central Command. How did the U.S. military buildup begin? In May this year, the White House announced that the Joe Biden administration plans to make a series of moves in the Persian Gulf region without specifying what those moves would include. In mid-July, Pentagon spokeswoman Sabrina Singh stated that the Department of Defense is increasing its presence in quotes to monitor the Strait of Hamas and surrounding waters, revealing some military details. The Pentagon announced the deployment of A-10 Thunderbolt II attack bombers, F-16 and F-35 fighters, as well as the guided missile destroyer USS Thomas Hudner. In the following days, the deployment of USS Carter Hall and USS Bataan was also announced. The latter was already deployed off Iran's coast in January 2020, when the U.S. and Iran were on the brink of war over the assassination of Iran's top anti-terror commander, Lieutenant General Qasem Soleimani. What is the pretext of U.S. militarization? Official U.S. explanations for deploying new forces in the Persian Gulf are alleging Iran's, in quote, harassment of free navigation and accusations that it contributes to, in quote, regional instability. 
In reality, as experts opine, it is the U.S. that began harassing ships and tankers with Iranian exports, forcing sailors to dock at unscheduled ports, seizing the cargo and selling it to its own companies. These U.S. illegal activities were part of former U.S. President Donald Trump's so-called maximum pressure campaign against Iran, and the purpose was to isolate Iran commercially from the world. Things, however, didn't go according to plan for Washington as Iran retaliated in full measure, targeting the ship's of states and companies that took direct part in American piracy. Iran's retaliatory campaign has proven to be an effective method of deterrence. And today, no energy company wants to buy stolen Iranian oil from tankers on a forced berth in Texas, bearing repercussions. What is the real reason for U.S. militarization? The U.S. military muscle flexing in the Persian Gulf has to be seen in the context of the U.S. military-industrial complex's malicious plans against Iran and security and stability in the region. First, the U.S. wants to discourage Iran from retaliatory measures and seeks to send a message to energy companies that they can freely buy stolen Iranian oil. This indicates that Washington has no intention of stopping piracy activities and economic warfare against the Islamic Republic of Iran, but only plans to intensify it in the near future. Furthermore, the U.S. is evidently missed with the diplomatic reapproachment between Iran and the Arab states of the Persian Gulf, as well as their efforts to control their seas with a joint naval coalition. Washington wants to convince the Arab countries that it is more beneficial for them to continue the hostility with Iran and look for a reapproachment with the Israeli regime, signaling that it will be their guardian and that the U.S. Navy will be a buffer zone. The most important reason for American militarization in the Persian Gulf can be read from the statements of Israeli regime officials who in recent years have repeatedly asked Washington to reject the nuclear agreement and to threaten Iran with military buildup. The refusal of the Biden administration to return to the nuclear deal and lift sanctions as well as the latest deployment of forces testify that the U.S. administration, regardless of party affiliations, unquestionably follows the Zionist warmongering policy on Iran. What is Iran's response? Iran has responded to the deployment of U.S. military forces in the Persian Gulf in kind, strengthening its own coastal and maritime presence, holding military exercises and publicly unveiling new weapons. On August 2nd, the Islamic Revolution Guards Corps Navy started drills close to the three islands of Abu Musa, the Greater and Lesser Tums, as well as the lesser known island of Nazit. Various units of the IRGC Navy, including the Combat Naval Missile Drone Rapid Reaction Electronic Warfare and Airborne Units, backed by the IRGC Aerospace Force exercised a range of military tactics. The IRGC has deployed various types of weapons and equipment in the drills, most notable the Abu Mahadi naval cruise missile with a range of over a thousand kilometers. Okay, let me just get back. I lost my spot. Okay, this looks very dangerous to me. It does. Okay, the reason why is, okay, let's get into a little more background. Okay. The United States has been very miffed by the Chinese successful attempt to 
to broker okay, a rapprochement okay, between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And the United States would very much like to break up that um, but, um, but, um, but, um, but, um, but combination. They see it as very inimical okay, to American interests. And you can see how since the two coming together, there's, you know, continued independence being expressed in their behavior by the Saudis, who have been turning away from the Abrahamic Accords and who have been looking for more cooperation with uh, 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 the Iranians um, and with the Chinese, uh, uh, you know, through the longer term vision okay, of being a part of the Belt and Road Initiative mm -hmm. and actually making long term peace with uh, the Shia regimes. That is one way okay, for the monarchy to become secure okay, over a period of time. Uh, the conflict with Iran, which was going on, uh, was very much a matter of uh, decreasing Saudi security. Uh, the Houthi rebellion, okay, in Yemen was really threatening to the Saudis, which is why they've been fighting a terrible war there, which resulted in 400,000 fatalities, uh, you know, on the part, okay, of the Yemeni uh, uh, Houthis. Very, very brutal war, just as brutal, okay, as Ukraine. But we don't hear much about it because it doesn't receive a lot of attention okay, in the American media. Uh, okay, if you figure though, there have been four hundred thousand fatalities um, 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 uh, in Ukraine on the part of the Ukrainians, and four hundred thousand fatalities, okay, in Yemen. Uh, the bloodbath in both countries is very, very extensive. Okay, but in Yemen, the United States has been a more active part okay, of the bloodbath because it's been supporting uh, Saudi bombing okay, of Yemen and the atrocities that have been being committed by the Saudis. Now, why are the Saudis doing all this? Because they see the Shias, okay, in Yemen, and there are a lot of Shias there, as being a real threat to the Sunni Muslims, okay, in uh, uh, um, Saudi Arabia, and especially to the Wahhabi sect. They also face the long-term opposition of the Iranians, who were absolutely opposed to the Saudi monarchy. It's not even so much a consideration that, uh, uh, you know, they don't care for Sunni Muslims, think that they are uh, heretics. Of course, the feeling is returned by the Sunni Muslims. That, okay, is bad enough. But the Ayatollahs, okay, in Iran are very much opposed to, to monarchy to the idea, okay, of monarchy, the very idea. Uh, so there's that kind of ideological opposition to the Saudis, okay, as well. Okay, if you look at the various potential threats to the Saudis, and you look at the access to the sea the Saudis have, uh, um, for their oil, 
the conflict in Yemen is a great uh, threat, okay, to them because the potential is there uh, uh, for Yemen, okay, if there is a regime change, okay, in Yemen to cut off the Saudi access to the Red Sea. And the Iranians, of course, have the capability uh, to cut off their access to the Persian Gulf. If the Egyptians would decide, uh, 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 you know, were to decide if they had a regime change there, and they were to decide to not let the Saudis go through the Suez Canal, then the Saudis wouldn't be able to ship their oil all over the world. So there's a real threat okay, to the monarchy to its whole GDP, which is based something like 87% on oil. So the Saudis see themselves in a crisis type situation. And they became very exercised when in a recent uh, 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 um, the threat of conflict in part of the peninsula okay, came about, the United States did not immediately send troops in in order to defend uh, the, uh, the Saudi regime because of politics in the United States. In other words, before that particular crisis, they had all, we had always sent in troops to support them. But we didn't send those troops. And the Saudis and Mohammed bin Salman looked at this as a lessening of commitment by the United States to defend them. So the Saudis are looking for a long-term bilateral security agreement with the United States, which the United States doesn't want to give because it would be very unpopular here. And so they've been basically playing off the Iranians and the Chinese, okay, against the United States in order to get such a long-term security agreement. And they've been loosening their ties with uh, the, uh, the Abrahamic Accords as well. And they've been very hesitant to formalize their ties to Israel. Which is and, uh, which is so, very much desires, because that strengthens the hands of Israel with respect to the ethnic cleansing they're performing on the Palestinians. I was going to say Israel and the Saudis, they have their own kind of underhanded, quiet type of trade and working together. I, and I guess in where business is concerned. Uh, right, but the Israelis very much want to formalize the ties. And the United States would like Saudi to formalize the ties also, but Saudis are, are basically telling the United States there's a very high price to pay here. And it's that price high is price. a formal bilateral alliance with us. So things are kind of poised on a knife edge here as to whether the Saudis will stay with the West to okay, in the longer run, with the collective West to okay, in the longer run, with all that that implies, or will basically go over to the Eastern Bloc and pursue security through the good offices of the Chinese and incorporation into the Belt and Road Initiative. So that's a lot of what's behind the military buildup inside of the Persian Gulf. But I have to go in about a minute. But I want to say the reason why that buildup is so dangerous, or another reason why it's so dangerous, is because the Iranian naval capability inside of the Persian Gulf is very much to be reckoned with right now. In other words, they don't have the aircraft aircraft carriers we have. 
There are a lot of things they don't have that we have, but they've been developing a very form, a very, very strong drone capability. That drone capability can be used to attack our ships, including okay, our aircraft carriers, our destroyers, any big ships that we have. And they have strong missile capabilities, okay, that they developed, which, of course, uh, have sufficient distance capability to threaten our ships in the Gulf. Mm -hmm. So we're setting up a big confrontation between the Iranian military capability, which, of course, can't compare with the general capability of the U.S. all over the world, but in their region, Iran is a regional power, which is very formidable and very good in the missile and drone area. And we may be risking taking a big hit with respect to our ships by going into the Persian Gulf in force this way. Oh, yes, we would. And I was going to say the Saudis would be better off going with the East because where BRICS is concerned, Palestine is on BRICS and there would be unity with more unity within the region. Even uh, though the leaders, a lot of the leaders in the region say they'll do things with the U.S., with Israel or whatever, but they're going against their populations. Their populations support Palestine and the Palestinian people. And all that is true. But it's also true that from the standpoint of the Saudi monarchy, uh, it, it may not be the case that they trust the security framework the Chinese are implicitly offering them because the Iranians are so opposed to the monarchy and so opposed to uh, Sunni Islam that they might not be willing to keep the peace. They may keep on supporting efforts to throw the regime out in Saudi. And if the Saudis continue to think that's a serious threat, in spite of the rapprochement, they may still choose to go with the West. Mm -hmm. So that's why this situation is very, very dicey. Okay, I have to go and start up okay, on my stream, which should be very, very interesting tonight because Okay. It's basically outlining the threats to democracy if the United States should re-elect Joe Biden. Now, there's last oh. Friday, uh, you know, if you recall, okay, last Friday, I discussed the threats from Trump, which are considerable. But here I'm raising the issue of what are the threats from Biden if uh, uh, he is re-elected? And, of course, why we should use dump the corruption in both of these instances to dump them both. So that's going to be... Good. I'll be right over, over there. So I'm going <laughs> <laughs> over there right now. Okay, I'm going to close out the show. I just want to thank everyone. Thanks, Steve. See, Wolf Brent was here. I okay, thank, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Steve, for being here and your support. And I thank everybody else that's been here for coming and joining the show. And um, if you're watching later, please hit the like button, subscribe and share. And if you get a chance, you can buy me a coffee. I'd appreciate that. Thank you and good night.